Welcome to the Listen Up Podcast, where we explore hearing loss, communication, connections, and health. Hi, everybody. Dr. Mark Sims here. I'm the host of the Listen Up Podcast, where I feature leaders in healthcare and business. Past guests include Dr. Jeremy Weiss of Rise 25. The reason I, this, this episode is brought to you by the Listen Up Hearing Center. The reason I am so passionate about hearing loss is because I've lost my brother, Robbie, twice. First, to the hearing loss from the radiation to his brain tumor, and then again, from a complication to that. I help patients and families to reconnect by treating their hearing loss and to remain and help patients with hearing loss to remain independent. I am an ear, nose, and throat who only cares for ears, so I'm the E of ENT. I've performed over 10,000 surgeries and treated many more with hearing loss. I'm the founder of Listen Up Hearing Centers. I'm also the author of the same, book of the same name, Listen Up, A Physician's Guide to Effectively Treating Your Hearing Loss. If you want to learn more, go to www.listenuphearing.com. If you have any other questions, you can email me at that point, from, at that site. Today, I'm excited to have a great guest. It's Vance Mars. He is a Walt Disney World Resort Management alumni, having spent 10 years as a leader at, in the resorts. He runs the only Disney service and direct response marketing business on the planet. He coaches companies to create Disney-style service systems and then monetize them through direct response marketing. I think he has a great application in the medical field and the hearing field, and that's why I'm here to talk to him. My good friend, Jeremy Weiss, connected us. Hey, Vance, thanks for coming on the podcast. My pleasure, Dr. Sims. Happy to be here. This will be fun. Please, you call me Mark. I appreciate it. Um, You know, so tell me a little bit about your background and how you ended up at Disney and what that taught you. Sure. Um, Luckily, it was my uh, first, almost first job out of uh, straight out of college. So I had a buddy of mine um, that I went to school with, was a recruiter for Disney. Um, I was in Western Mass at the time, which there is nothing going on in Western Massachusetts. Um, so I wanted to hightail it out of there. He said, come on down. We got a lot going on. And, uh, that was the extent of my interview. Um, that does not happen anymore. I will, I will tell you that, uh, I was on the opening team of the yacht and beach club resort, um, which is, uh, over there by Epcot. And it was an incredible experience. I mean, I, you know, 23 years old, um, my first job at a big company, and I'm opening up this, you know, however many bajillion dollar uh, resort, um, just absolutely. The, I, I was I was hooked by how Disney uses systems to create magic, um, because I mean I had been to Disney as a guest, um, and you know, oohed and odd with everybody else, uh, but to be on the opposite side creating the things that people oohed and odd over um, was just uh, nothing short of, of amazing. So um, spent 10 years there. Um, I managed, if you can believe it, Disney used to have nightclubs, a uh, place called Pleasure Island. Um, wow. Isn't that a, a reality TV show now or something? <laughs> it probably is. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but that was Disney's failed attempt at booze, debauchery, nighttime entertainment, scantily clad women, and all that stuff. Um, I say failed because financially it was a cash cow. I mean, you know, it's a big bar. There's great not margins. With, and not consistent with Disney, beer. though. Um, but it didn't really go with Disney. the rest of, you know what I mean? Well, I, I will tell you, uh, just as a quick side, a shout out to one of my roommates from college. He was from Westfield, Massachusetts. Oh, yeah. So, uh, he used to show me the local paper and we used to laugh about the stories about like, you know, the squirrel that caused the electrical outage. So it, it, it's a beautiful place, but I can attest there's probably not a lot going on there. So, yeah, well, so I mean, we did have the Basketball Hall of Fame, but that was that's correct. Yes, that's uh, about so, it. Uh, yes. So it's in Springfield, right? Yes. Yeah. So um so when you say that, that Disney created magic through systems, can you explain that some more? Sure. You know, I, I liken it to a uh, a magic show. So if you've ever been to one, you're sitting in the audience, you're like, oh, my God, it's incredible. How did he make the elephant disappear? How did he chop up a woman into 27 pieces and then manage to put her back together in the same order again? Um, but from a magician's point of view, all it is is repeatable replicatable and practiced system to create the illusion. 
Um, so it's a very different point of view. So when you get on the other side, um, it is literally, I mean, you know, Disney's, they, they do what I can, what I call, I mean, they Disneyfy. Um, I've coined the term Disneyfy, which is creating experiences out of the mundane. So we all have mundane things that we have to do every day, day in and day out to keep our businesses running, to interact with uh, patients and uh, clients. And what Disney has done is taken each of those interaction points that either a cast member is going to have, which is what Disney calls their employees, um, with a guest um, and created experiences out of the, each one of those little points. So just the fact of, you know, good morning. Um, you know, I was at Disney just a few weeks ago and there were people walking to work from the employee parking lot and all were saying good morning. You know, I mean, yeah, I stayed at a, you know, a fairly nice hotel uh, a while back, not on a Disney property. And again, walk, seeing people walk to work and everybody got their head down and they're trudging and, you know, it's, um, uh, so they know that the minute that they are, you know, what Disney calls on stage, that they are performing. Um, so regardless of what their job was. Um, so, and then to see the level of detail that Disney goes to, to create the stuff that the cast members work in. Um, you know, we were talking about the Yacht and Beach Club. The, the pool there is a five acre sand bottom pool. Drop. I mean, you could spend the weekend there and never right. go see a Disney park. I mean, it's beautiful. Originally, they wanted to have live fish swimming in it. Um, now, this With was the bathers. Something. What's that? With people swimming in the pool. Yes. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Um, you, you would never have seen it because when we started, uh, they could not get the chemicals balanced where it was safe for people to swim and it didn't kill the, the fish. fish. So, uh, you know, every morning we we're plucking things out. But this is how they think. They think, hey, this is a sand bottom pool. It's just like wading through, you know, nice clear waters in the Caribbean. And, um, you know, and that, well, there's fish there. Um, you know, I don't know that that was probably the best choice, but. Um, well, at least they tried, right? Yeah. Um, the other thing is, is that every, I mean, Disney is a storytelling company, has been since Walt created. Um, did you know, and this is one one of those, did you know that everything at Disney has a story behind it? Every building, every attraction, down to the little statues. Um, I'll give you an example. So uh, if you go to Disney, uh, next time you're there, go to Epcot. Go over to the China Pavilion. Look up at the Chinese restaurant, and you'll see a little uh, statue of a guy riding on top of a rooster. Now, thousands of people walk past that every day and probably don't notice that little dude riding a rooster. I mean, it's 12 inches. Well, that is Emperor Min, who was a evil, evil prince in like the third century. And he was hung because he was so cruel to his people. And now... Uh, in Chinese culture, you put a uh, you put that statue uh, to ward off evil spirits. Oh, interesting. Now, this is a 12 inch statue that virtually everybody's going to miss. But that is the level of detail that Disney goes to to create it. And, you know, if that was missing, would it, would it really affect the entire experience? Probably not. But when you take all of those details and put them into the complete package, you know, if you miss one, all right, you know, it's like Disney paints certain stuff every night of the week, uh, you know, to keep it fresh and make it look good. They know at exactly what time every night to paint it based on weather, temperature, humidity, et cetera, so that it'll be dry for the first guest. Now, if a, an accountant got a hold of this, they'd say, well, paint it every other night. 
or paint it every third night. Right. And sooner or later, the thing looks like garbage. Um, so, you know, so, just, so, I mean, that's really it. To me, that was, those were the two big things was, oh my gosh, there's, you know, here's what you do to create magic, a system. Um, and then the attention to detail was just amazing. Yeah, I mean, that attention to detail is amazing. I guess when you tell that story, you know, so I think about my practice. So, you know, <clears throat> I have my own personal system, right? The way I get ready for work and all those mm-hmm. things. The, the question is, is how do you take a system that you want somebody else? Like, so how do you get all of the cast members to say good morning every day? In other words, is there documentation? Is it the training? Is it the hiring? I mean, is it all of those things? I mean, how do you get that? Sure. I mean, it is all of those things. Um, however, it's not daunting um, by any stretch. When I say system, Disney uses very simple system um, because if it was complex, nothing would get done. Um, you know, they've got 85,000 employees just at the Orlando property alone. Um, so to get 85,000 people singing the same song, uh, we should be able to get our 10 person office answering the phone the way we want them. Right. Um, we would think, uh, but so, so Disney sets up their training. Eat, uh, we'll go back to the, uh, those creating uh, wow moments, um, right. uh, you know, answering the phone. So there is a standard, um, a, you know, on the job training manual. And inside of it is the system for how to answer the phone. Okay. And it's set up in three columns. Disney runs everything on three words, what to do, how to do it. And most importantly, why do we do it this way? Okay. Um, and, and it's that last one that really um, gets the employees engaged because they finally understand. Because usually you go to a place to work and say, hey, answer the phone this way because the boss says, so. you know, that, that. But if you knew why you answered the phone a certain way, you'd be more inclined to do it that way because you now are part of the bigger picture. You are now um, feel like, oh, you're contributing. You're not just a number. I mean, with 85,000 employees, you know, everybody's a number, but they're not. They know that each one of those individuals makes up the entire thing. Yes. So yes, hiring is a big part of it. Um, Training um, is, is ongoing. Um, you know, Disney's salaried people, the, uh, the, the leaders um, go through, you know, up to two weeks a year of, um, of training that, are, that has nothing to do with the actual job that they do, but it's, you know, leadership training, is guest experience training. It could, you know, it could just be three days away um, working in a mastermind setting. Right. Um, so, they they do that, and hourlies actually have anywhere between forty eight and seventy two hours um, of training. So two to three weeks before get, they start. Right. They also get you know just a tick over a week of training outside of the um, um, uh, you know the job. The cool thing though, and this is this is the secret sauce. So I don't know how much you charge for. Uh, listening to one of your episodes, but this is definitely worth the price of admission. Okay. Um, is that Disney gets the hourly employees to create, I would say, easily 90% of the systems that you would see in a park or in a resort. Um, and they do that because, one, because they work it every single day. They're the front uh, line, right? And they, they know the answer on how to make this work better. Um, a great example of this is recently, uh, if you've been there to the Magic Kingdom, there are a number of ways you can get from the parking lot over to the park. Uh, one of them are these big uh, uh, old time uh, paddle wheel boats. Um, right. And up until December, there was one way on the boat. Everybody just went down the gangplank, you loaded up the boat, um, and it was two stories. So some people went up the stairs, other people stayed right where they were. Um, and then the boat goes across the lake and everybody piles out the gangplank on the other end. Well, Disney wants to make sure that people get to the park quickly um, and efficiently because they will, one, start spending money faster. 
but two, they'll have a better experience. So they go through these process experience workshops with their employees and say, how do we make this better? So they came up, the employees said, look, we could get the people across or we could load the boats faster if we had a gangplank that led not only to the first floor that we already have, but installing one that led to the second floor. Now they load the boat 40% faster. It goes out that much quicker. It unloads 40% quicker. And now they're getting people back and forth a lot. It was an employee idea. Right. Those boats have been running for decades and nobody thought of it until last year. So that that's that. And that's why, I mean, Disney is not known for great pay, but they are known for engaging their employees in the operations. And they have, I mean, I don't like to use that term ownership. I mean, you know, I mean, unless you have a majority of the stock in the company, you don't own squat there. Um, but you do have a feeling of engagement. You do have a feeling of worth that the, um, you know, that the company does find value in you. Yeah, that's great. And so how do they codify it? In other words, they write it down, Mm -hmm. but how's it accessible? I mean, is it books, computers, smartphones? Uh, Well, I mean, when I was there, uh, you know, one of the problems we solved was the, uh, uh, was lost cars in the parking lot. Um, and this was literally, you know, it becomes a written document on how to find the lost cars. Um, and it's written in the what to do, how to do it, and why we do it this way. And I'm, now I'm sure it's, you know, it's uh, uh, electronic, uh, right. so you can access it. But, you know, through the training, and this is one of the things that's great about it, is that those standards become the training man. And so, it, you know, if you sit next to Marge and Marge answers the phone and Marge is your trainer um, and you have the manual in front of you, if Marge answers the phone any other way than what's in the book, you kind of look at Marge and you're like, Marge, why? The book right. says to answer it this way. Why are you answering it that way? Right. So it almost keeps them in, you know, in check there. Uh, but so, I mean, that I mean, it's a they have meetings, you know, consistently process improvement meetings. All the time, it's documented. Uh, some things work, some things don't, um, but completely documented, and it's used to um, to do the training. And so, you would recommend those same types of systems for any small business, right? I, I would. And if you don't have them, don't get your head ready to explode. That oh my god, I got to create this three inch thick binder. Don't do that. One a week. At the end of the year, you'll have 52 of them, 50 if you take a couple of weeks off, you know, and what you want to do is map these out. So priorities, right? Exactly. So Matt, I would what I would do is map out your every uh, point where you've got an interaction with a patient uh, and start at the beginning. So is that a postcard? Is that a phone call? Is that interaction with the website, et cetera? And then go through the entire sequence of every touch point you have with that patient. Look at it and say, okay, prioritize it exactly. Which one of these should we work on first? What's going to either have uh, the the most uh, benefit to the overall patient experience? What's going to have maybe a financial benefit? Um, what, you know, something What's like the that. most pressing thing to fix or yeah. to document, and then. You take that one thing and you get together and you say, all right, what are we doing right now? And you, everybody just brain dump, you know, brainstorm, dump it all on a piece of paper. Okay, great. How do we make it better? Walt Disney called it plussing. How can we plus the show? So you ask the question, how can we do this better? And you let, I mean, no bad answers. You let the employees you know, write down, oh yeah, we should answer the phone this way. Or, you know, we should, you know, put fresh coffee in the waiting room or, or you know, whatever. Um, and then you come to agreement. And the thing is the management or, you know, the owners put parameters on it. I mean, you know, you're not going to build. You're not going to go down and wash everybody's car. Yeah. And you're not going to put a Starbucks in your waiting. Room, you know, right. that kind of thing. Um, but you are going to um, get some great ideas. 
And then you come to an agreement on which one and how it's going to be done. You come up with why we do it that way. Um, and the employees are like, the cool thing is, is the employees came up with it. It becomes their new standard. And you just tell them, you know, all that stuff we used to do, we ain't doing it anymore. Put a big red X through it. And now here's the new standard. And then in six months, nine months, whatever, revisit that one and say, okay, well, we're doing it this way. How can we make it better? And I mean, if you just get into the, I've implemented this in one of my bricks and mortar businesses. I own three um, in Maryland. Um, one is a carpet cleaning company. And if I can implement this in a carpet cleaning company, yeah, which is right. not exactly, you know, on the higher echelon up the totem pole of home service businesses. Um, if I can do it in there, you can take this into any business um, and make it work. Are there templates out there or, you know, starting points or methodologies of how to do it? Um, I mean, the way I laid it out, um, I mean, I've got, you know, a bunch of exercises and workshops that I can take people through. Uh, but I mean, to get started, you do, pen and paper is it. You know? Yeah, it's just, I think sometimes people, um, you know, is it a overall 40,000 foot view? Or as somebody said to me, is it how to make peanut butter and jelly sandwich? Meaning get the bread, get the peanut butter, get the jelly, put them on the countertop, open the bread, take two slices of bread, open them yep. up. I mean, is it that type of detail or is yes. it? Yes, it is. And the thing is, is that the owner or the doctor doesn't have to be the one doing that. No, agreed. Because frankly, there's technical stuff that I'm actually not an expert at, like the right. insurance side of things. You know, I delegate that out to others to run that. Correctly. And, and that's what we did at Disney when I created uh, Chef Mickey's, uh, which is one of the character dining experiences there. We had each of the departments come up and document their own process. You know, so throughout a shift, they just, okay, at 10 o'clock, we did this. At 10.15, we did that. Um, and then, okay, well, we did that. How did we do it? Um, and then we ask ourselves, why do we do it? And, well, if we don't have a good why. Well, should we be doing it at all? Um, so it's very iterative, too. In other words, oh, yeah. it's like a living document for support. And so, uh, and how long, I guess, you know, that's a bigger process rather than one single point. So the hope is, you do one a week and then maybe you have to revisit that if it needs any uh, brushing up over the next couple of weeks. And then you're working on the next and the next and the next. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And I mean, you know, some of them are easy, you know, I mean, they're just Actually, how do you answer the phone. How they answer the phone is relatively easy you once know. you define it. That week you could do two, you know. Right. Right. Great. And, and so are there uh, any tools you recommend for recording these types of things or is it just a binder with three, three punch paper. Or? I am a big fan of binders. Um, I just, I am a tactile guy. I like to have yeah. the thing right in front of me. I'm not, you know, uh, you know, whiteboards, uh, you know, those big, uh, post-it sheet pads, um, you know, get a couple of Sharpies, you write on them, you plaster them up on the walls. Um, I like those cause you can pick one up and move it and put it in a different sequence. Um, and then, you know, you assign somebody to be a stenographer, note taker, um, and um, and go from there. You know, I, I mean, I think as a I, you could certainly do it. I'm actually a big fan of um, when I'm doing stuff just myself because it would I'd look pretty silly posting these things up around my office. <laughs> I I just use three by five cards. Yeah, yeah. They're, and they're... I, I literally each three by five card has one thing written on it. And now I can go to you know a big table, lay them all out, and move them around um, how they how they need to go. So. Um, I'm keeping the office supply store well, well, uh, well in business. So, so this is great stuff. And so what other ways do you help businesses uh, do this type of stuff? And it's like, what, what other tools do you do that are a little higher, you know, then obviously that's one place to start, but I suspect that when people want to continue to push higher and higher, they need uh, more sophisticated tools and more guidance. So yeah, what type of things do you do? Yeah. I mean, certainly working with a leadership team or an owner, um, one of the crucial things that you have to have is your mission. You know, what is your mission? During your introduction, um, you know, the story about your brother um, is just is very powerful. Right. Um, and people need to have missions that are that powerful and that their employees can wrap their heads around. For example, Disney's mission 
is I'm sure they have it. And this is not a mission statement. You know, that thing that goes in a three ring binder up on the shelf to collect. Nobody reads. Yeah. You know, this, this is not that it's simple. So Disney's is create happiness, make people happy. Any entry level minimum wage employee can wrap their head around that. Um, And remember your mission has to be bigger than your job. Um, So like the mission for my cleaning company is we create healthy homes. We do it through the cleaning the job, but we create healthy homes. All of my guys that work for me can wrap their head around. Oh yeah. By cleaning, we are making the home a healthier. Healthier, So um, that is certainly, you know, and I take people through, I mean, this is sometimes, sometimes takes days, um, you know, to get down to it. Um, You know, I I worked with an orthodontist, um, you know, uh, who his was, uh, we're going to create a million smiles. Um, Okay, yeah, that's good. That's a good mission. Um, You know, or another one was, um, you know, we provide, um, we provide executives with uh, self-confidence. This is an orthodontist. Mm-hmm. Because if you got bad teeth, you're not going to smile right. and you're not going to be confident in your presentation. So, you know, this guy was a professional targeted professionals um, right. for his market. And um, that's what he did. So everybody in the office could wrap their head around, you know, yeah, we're whitening teeth or we're straightening them. That's the job. But our mission was to give executives more self confidence. Yeah, that's great. So that's really good stuff. Kind of mit- uh, merging the mission with the operations to make sure that there's a connection rather than going through some Franklin Covey exercise, putting it up on a, on a wall. And then it actually, you know, I mean, I've been to places where people are actually doing the exact opposite of their mission statement, which is actually <laughs> hanging over their head. Right. Well, and, and that's the crazy thing. You know, when I, with my private clients on my first visit to the office, you know, I will go up to the receptionist or, you know, Marge or whoever's sitting at the desk. I say, so, you know, what are you guys all about? What's your mission here? And all they do, I mean, they're like one of those beboppers. They're trying to look over my shoulder, you know, at the mission statement that's on the wall behind <laughs> me and trying to read it. And I'm like, nah, that's not what I'm talking about. So, yeah, I mean, it's got to be simple, too. If you if your employees can't wrap their heads around it, that means they don't understand it and the mission is not clear. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. Uh, the, the, it's a little catchy, but as I think about it, mine is here, here. Mm-hmm. P-A-R-H-E-R-E, right? Here, here. So, But everybody knows. Uh, n- every, you can understand that. No, well, I just actually came up with that. So now I have to. Oh, all right. Well, <laughs> so, so I'm going to write it down. <laughs> this is great stuff. If people want to get a hold of you and uh, utilize your services, how, how would they get a hold of you? Yeah, uh, best thing is through uh, my website, which is deliverservicenow.com. Um, there's a uh, great little blueprint um, that you can download. I actually have a, a, a book. It's called uh, Systematic Magic, uh, Seven Magic Keys to Disneyfy Any Business. Um, you can actually get the book for free from my website. Just pay shipping and handling. Uh, and you're more than welcome to buy it on Amazon. Like I'll, I'll certainly take my 30 cents in royalties. Um, right. But uh, yeah, through there is through the website is is probably best. Um, and, you know. There's a there's a range of stuff in there. Um, and the cool thing with that blueprint is that there's stuff that it, I mean, it's going to take you 10 minutes to read through it. One idea is worth it. it and, and that's, you know, and it's stuff that you can implement immediately. I mean, you read it today when you go back to the office Monday, you know, you can implement. That's great. What's the website again? It's called DeliverServiceNow.com. DeliverServiceNow.com. I'll be going looking right after. Well, Vince, this has been great. I really appreciate your time coming on, uh, sharing with us your experience and how people can uh, prevent it. And uh, we've got some work to do uh, ourselves, but hopefully some other people benefit because this is really what makes the whole thing magical. It's not just treating people. It's giving people a whole experience of confidence and great health. So yes, thanks it for certainly is. On. Thanks so much, Mark. I appreciate you having me on. Oh, yeah. Thanks. This has been great. Thanks for tuning in to the Listen Up podcast. We'll see you again next time and be sure to click subscribe to get updates on future episodes.